Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we learn to deal with functions defined on Rn. And indeed, in today's part 18, we will continue generalizing facts we already know from real analysis. In particular, today we talk about extreme values of functions. However, before we do that, you already know, first I want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget to download the PDF version and the quiz for this video with the link in the description. Okay, then I would say we can immediately start with the definition for extreme values. So if this here is the graph of a function defined on R2, you would say you find a maximum of the function here at the top. However, of course, it could happen that the function somewhere else is even higher than that. Therefore, more precisely, our value here is called a local extremum for the function. Hence, the correct picture here is that we fix the point x0 in the domain and then we look around a neighborhood in the domain. So it might be better to just sketch the domain and then use contour lines for the function f. And now you know, we only want to look around the point x0, so it doesn't matter what happens far away from it. In other words, we will just consider an epsilon neighborhood of x0. Indeed, this notation we introduced in part 6 and was given by b epsilon x0. And now, if we restrict the function f to this epsilon neighborhood, we find an actual maximum at the point x0. And there you see, this is the whole meaning of local in this term. However, of course, we will write that down in a definition. For that, we will fix the domain d in Rn. And also a function f defined on d and it should map into R. In fact, for the definition here, it could be any function, but usually we would have a continuous function. Okay, then let's first define the term local maximum of the function f. More precisely, we would say that the function f has a local maximum at a point x0 in d. And we say that if we find an epsilon neighborhood around this point x0 such that f of x0 is the maximum of this function in this neighborhood. Hence, we could write f of x0 is always greater or equal than all the other values. More precisely, we would write this inequality holds for all x in d intersected with b epsilon x0. So it's exactly the picture from above, but now restricted to the domain of definition d. Hence you see, this defines the term local maximum. However, here you should note that we don't have the strict inequality here. Hence, also for a constant function, we would have local maxima. If you want to exclude that, we will say that we have an isolated local maximum. So you see, the definition should be exactly the same, we just add the word isolated in front of local maximum. And then you see that we want to have the strict inequality here, which results that we only have one local maximum in this neighborhood. So you see, this definition here is more restrictive than the other one, and it actually corresponds to our picture here. And soon we will see that both definitions are important depending what you want to show. And now maybe not so surprising, we can formulate exactly the same things now for local minima. In fact, the only thing that changes here is the direction of the inequality. Now f of x0 should be smaller than every other value in the neighborhood. And of course, exactly the same we can formulate for the isolated local minimum. Which means there we have now the strict inequality as before. Okay, with all of that, now we should also know what a local extremum is. Namely, we would say that f has a local extremum at x0 if it has a local minimum or a local maximum. Therefore, you should see this is not a complicated definition at all. In other words, the term local extrema just puts local maxima and local minima into the same box. That's helpful simply because often we are interested in maxima and minima at the same time. Okay, at this point you should recall that in the one dimensional case we already know necessary and sufficient conditions for local extrema. And indeed, they translate nicely into the multidimensional case. So you know, 
In the one-dimensional case, the necessary condition for a local extremum needs the first derivative of f. Hence, we now consider continuously differentiable functions defined on Rn. This makes the whole description a little bit simpler, because we know that the gradient exists at all the points. And now let's assume that we already know that f has a local extremum at the point x0. In fact, then we can simply show, in the same way as in the one-dimensional case, that the first derivative at x0 has to vanish. However, the first derivative in the multivariable case is the gradient of f. And we would say that this one vanishes if it's exactly equal to the zero vector. This makes totally sense if you recall part 10 where we talked about the directional derivatives the gradient describes. Also helpful here to understand this is the sentence that the gradient describes the direction with the fastest increase. Obviously, if we are at a local extremum, there should be no direction with an increase. So in summary, you should see here, we can just redo the proof from real analysis. However, from the one-dimensional case, we also know that this fact here, this criterion, is not sufficient for having a local extremum. But for example, we know that together with the second derivative, we can get sufficient conditions. And now the natural question is, can we say something in the multivariable case as well? And indeed, one nice possibility would be to use Taylor's theorem from the last video. However, in this case, we want to use C3 functions. Because then we have the nice quadratic approximation and the nice formula for the remainder term. So please recall this important theorem from part 16. Okay, so we fix such a function f and x0 as a so-called critical point. And indeed, this only means that the first derivative vanishes at the point. So the gradient of f at x0 is the zero vector. For this reason, the quadratic approximation for f around x0 is very simple. Namely, you would write, we have f of x0 plus a small vector h is equal to the value f of x0 plus the Jacobian matrix or the gradient, which vanishes here, plus the term with the Hessian matrix. And of course, this is the important part for us here. The so-called Hessian matrix consists of the second order partial derivatives and is denoted by hf. And then we just have the small remainder term at the end, which we call psi of h. Okay, and now you should know, roughly speaking, if h is small enough, the whole behavior around x0 is described by this term here. In other words, the Hessian matrix should tell us if we are at a local maximum or at a local minimum. In addition, it would be nice if it would also be able to tell us if we are at all at a local extremum. In fact, we are able to distinguish different cases here. So the first case here would be that the matrix HF is positive definite. Now, if you don't know this notion, I can tell you, it simply means that our term here is strictly positive. And this holds for all vectors h that are not given by the zero vector. Simply because for the zero vector, of course, it would be always zero. However, in all other cases, we have a positive number here. Okay, and then you should see, if this term here is positive, around x zero, we get higher values out. In other words, the function f has a local minimum at x0. Moreover, because of our strict inequality here, we also get an isolated local minimum. Okay, so in summary, this condition here, together with the condition of the Hessian matrix, guarantees the existence of a local minimum. And now you might already guess, we can also flip this condition here to get a local maximum at x0. In other words, now the Hessian matrix should be negative definite. And this one is analogously defined as before, just with the less sign now. And now you know, this guarantees us that we have an isolated local maximum at x0. Okay, moreover, we also get a nice conclusion here if we are neither positive nor negative definite. This is what we call indefinite, 
which means that we find at least one age where we have a positive outcome and one age where we have a negative outcome. So indeed, it's important that both negative and positive values exist. Because then we see that we have both behaviors in our approximation, so we can see a local maximum or a local minimum depending in which direction we look. So if we put both things together, we see that there is not a local extremum at x0. In fact, we have something we would call a saddle point. Indeed, this one can be nicely described with a function defined on R2. So here we have a function that looks like it has a maximum or a minimum depending from which side we look at the graph. However, putting both things together, of course it means that we don't have a local extremum at this point. Hence, it's a common picture of a so-called saddle point. Okay, so in summary you see we have three nice conditions that decide if we have a local extremum or not. However, it's also possible to find a nice statement if we go the other direction. This means we put in as an assumption that we already know that f has a local extremum at x0. And then we can conclude something for the Hessian matrix. Namely, the maximum, which does not have to be an isolated maximum, guarantees that the Hessian is negative semi-definite. So not negative definite, but only negative semi-definite. And there you might already guess what it means. It means that this number here is less or equal than zero. So in particular, zero is also allowed as an outcome, even for vectors that are not the zero vector. Now, this conclusion here you can also understand if you recall our quadratic approximation from before. More concretely, if we have a maximum here at f of x0, this term here cannot be positive for any direction of h. However, of course, it could vanish for some directions. Indeed, this can even happen if f is an isolated local maximum. In particular, this means that the converse of this statement in 2 here is in general not correct. Okay, and now the last implication here is the same thing for a local minimum. And there we will get a Hessian matrix that is positive semi-definite. So it has the same meaning as before, we simply don't have the strict inequality here. So it's positive and zero is also allowed. And with that we have it, these are the nice relations we have between local extrema and the Hessian matrix of the function. And I would say, let's look at some nice examples in the next video. So let's meet there and have a nice day. Bye.